conflict between willing the end and willing the denial of the necessary means to achieve that end. So this talent would be the means to achieve some end that would be valuable to us. Um, and um, willing the denial of the means to that end conflicts with willing that. Kant apparently had some mixed feelings about um, whether this earlier on, whether this was a moral duty. And in his lectures before the publication of the groundwork, um, he denied that this was a moral duty. But by the time he got here, he decided that in fact it was. OK. And lastly, we have an imperfect duty to others um, of beneficence. So here I'm um, also going on to the 36, um, at the top of the page, um, we're supposed to imagine someone, um, someone who is prospering while he sees that others have to struggle with great hardships, he says, whom he could just as well help. And this person considers um, not to interfere or to help. So, Notice that there's not harm being done. What's being considered is simply not helping another person achieve their end. Um, and again, Kant says that there's no inconsistency in imagining a world like this. We can, in fact, imagine it. But in willing that world, willing the state of affairs in which everybody was indifferent to everyone else's ends, um, there would be a kind of practical contradiction. And this is because, he says, in many cases, um, yeah, uh, uh, in many cases yet to come, uh, one will need the love and compassion of others. Okay, so, the point is that in universalizing this maxim, you notice we're supposed to be making it a law of nature. Um, this is supposed to be something, so imagining that it is universal. We're supposed to be imagining that everyone acts on it, not just from now forward, but for all time, past, present, and future. It's supposed to be a law of nature, after all. We're supposed to imagine it to be a law. So, uh, in willing that um, social world in which nobody ever takes anyone else's ends to be valuable, um, we would be denying any assistance to ourselves in the future that we might need from someone else in pursuing our ends. But also, we'd be denying any assistance from anybody that we've ever received in the past. Um, and so, Kant, it, and Kant thinks that that would be a, a practical contradiction. So notice that there's a kind of empirical assumption here at work that Kant is a, pretty clearly relying on that human beings in general are needy, that we're dependent on one another. Um, it's not just that you know very poor people need money. Um, everybody, he thinks, sooner or later, or in the past, um, at some point in their lives, um, has ends, will have ends, or did have ends, that they could only accomplish with the assistance of others. So willing the denial of that assistance is incompatible with willing that end, which we have had or will have. That's the practical problem. OK, um, I want to emphasize one point about this example. And that is that Kant is not saying that we shouldn't act on this maxim, because if we do, people will be less likely to help us you know, in the future when we need it. And we'll be setting a bad example or something like this. Uh, that's not the way this argument is supposed to go. He's supposed to, he, 
be saying something like this. Attempting to will that social order is simply inconsistent with my own setting of and pursuit of my own ends. Um, because I wouldn't be able to successfully accomplish the things that are important to me that depend on assistance from others. And so those two acts of willing, willing some end that depends on assistance of others, and willing the social order in which nobody assists anybody else, are in, in conflict. Let other questions about those. I do need to go through, I mean, I did need to go through them fairly quickly, um, so we can move on to let me see other questions. Okay. Um, I said this before, um, but if, it is important to emphasize that um, a maxim that passes this test is um, uh, because of that, is a permissible maxim, one that we may act on, and does not imply that we have to aim to try to get everyone else to act on this. Um, it doesn't mean that this maxim is required of everyone. Um, and furthermore, and Kant points this out on the bottom of 36 to 37, um, talk of contradiction might make you think that Kant is saying that it's impossible to act on a maxim that fails this test. And I said this before, we often are able to act on maxims that cannot be universalized. These are impermissible maxims, they're morally bad maxims, but people do it anyway. Um, and when we do that, our success in accomplishing the end specified by a bad maxim depends on the fact that other people are not acting on that. Um, so this is um, what Kant says at the very bottom of 36 to 37. And, and this is an important lesson that we get from the formula of universal law. He says, if we now attend to ourselves in every transgression of a duty, so when we act on a maxim that cannot be universalized, we find that we actually do not will that our maxim should become a universal law. Of course not. That would involve some kind of contradiction. Since, as I just said, since that is impossible for us, that's what it means for the maxim to be impermissible. But that its opposite should rather uh, generally remain a law. We just take the liberty of making an exception to it for ourselves, or just for this once, to the advantage of our inclination. So that's a different way of seeing what's wrong with acting on a maxim that cannot be universalized. Namely, we're relying on everyone else to not act on that, and we're making an exception. Remember now that um, I mean, remember how this argument is supposed to go. Uh, our permissible ends are given objective value when we will them on the basis of a permissible maxim. Okay, so uh, it's through willing an end, rationally, that that end becomes valuable. Um, and the important point here that I'm emphasizing one more time is that these ends are given objective value um, by the act of rationally willing. So that was how we got the idea of universality in the first place. How we got the idea of the universalizability of the maxim. Because through willing, we thereby make that end objectively. Clear? Okay. 
So now we move toward the second formulation of the categorical imperative. This is on page 40. Um, so this is right at 428. This is, let me just read this passage and then we'll figure out what's, what's going on. He says, but suppose there were something the existence of which in itself had, has an absolute worth, that as an end in itself could be a ground of determinate laws, then the ground the, of a uh, possible categorical imperative, that is a practical law, would lie in it and only, and only in it alone. Now I say, so we assume here, really without argument so far, I say a human being and generally every rational being exists as an end in itself not merely as a means for the discretionary use for this or that will, but must in all actions, whether directed towards itself or also to other rational beings, always be considered at the same time an end. Okay, so this is going to be the formula of humanity. Uh, and the claim is that a human being, and generally every rational being, exists as an end in itself, not merely as a means for the discretion of use of this or that. Um, continue. All objects of inclination, he says, have a conditional worth only. For if the inclination and the needs founded on them did not exist, their object would be without worth. But the inclinations themselves, as sources of need, are so far from having an absolute worth, so as to make one wish for them as such, that to be entirely free from them must rather be the universal wish of every rational being. Therefore, the worth of any object to be acquired by our action is always conditional. Um, okay. Um, Actually, let me continue just further down for a second. Um, toward the bottom of page 40, then, he distinguishes between um, mere things, objects, that have a value derived from their use. So mere things are valuable to the extent that they are useful to a goodwill. Whereas persons, rational wills, are valuable in themselves. And then at the top of 41, he says, but if all worth were conditional and hence contingent, then for reasons so supreme practical principle, sorry, that for reason no supreme practical principle could be found at all. And so we get now um, stated in the form of an imperative on 429. So act that you use humanity always at the same time as an end, never nearly as an end. Okay. So um, we get this contrast here between contingent value of mere objects and absolute value of uh, of goods, of rational goods, of people. Um, and so the categorical imperative is basically saying um, to, in this formulation, to respect what's of absolute value. What is, as he says here, an end in itself. Um, okay, so a few important points to make about this. Comments on the formula of humanity. The first is, um, notice that there are two parts to this. This is easy to miss. Um, but first of all, there's a prohibition on using people as means only. So act that you use humanity, whether in your own person as well as in the persons of others, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. 